Just hold it close to your mouth. So. Thank you. I'm just going to move this a bit so I can see you all. Yeah. You know, I was kind of hoping to be the last one because it's, it's easier to, to see you. All right, well, happy Monday. Thank you all for uh, joining us. We have a very exciting panel. I do want to, um, first I'm Carlton English. I'm a reporter at Barron's covering uh, banks and financials. And we have a great team in front of us today to talk about navigating through volatility. So uh, kicking things off, we have uh, Kathy Enswell of Morgan Stanley. We have Marianne van der Vieden from uh, Fitch Ratings. And we have Andu or a K, I'm not going to say Karake. He gave me a phonetic, and now it's in my head. Uh, it's Indu Okarake. And with D. E. Shaw. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we definitely have just, I think, a diverse representation of financial services here. So just real quickly, I'll start with you, Kathy, if you can kind of say a little bit about what you do, and then we'll just take it down the line before we get into the meat of the session. OK, great. Thanks for having me. Sure. Yes, yeah, so I'm a financial advisor, private wealth advisor. I work with individuals and institutions, foundations, with their nations, with their money. So I am sort of boots on the ground when it comes to the, uh, the markets and helping clients navigate the volatility in the markets. Excellent. Marion? Thank you. Yeah, so my name is Marion van der Weyden. Uh, I work for Fitch Ratings. Uh, and within Fitch, I'm responsible for the ratings on financial institutions globally. Uh, previously, I was responsible for the structure finance ratings. Um, so we're taking very much a credit approach, looking at credit risk. Uh, not so much the investing, but um, explaining investors what really the credit risk uh, is in, in, for their potential investments. Um, I'm also f the chair of Fitch's Global DI Council since earlier this year. So these two topics come nicely together today. Yes. Name's Indu Karake. Uh, I work at DE Shaw. I focus on our fundamental equities business. Um, specifically, I focus on shareholder activism. So we uh, engage with large companies that are underperforming their potential for one reason or, or the next, try to come up with ideas for what's driving that underperformance, uh, and then uh, come up with recommendations that can um, improve the performance of those businesses. Excellent. So I don't think it's a surprise to anyone over uh, the last two years we've seen uh market volatility, we've seen intense uh, geopolitical uncertainty, um, domestically political uncertainty. Um, Marianne, I'm going to start with you, maybe just if you talk internally about what you've noticed at Fitch, just as a company, how you manage and, you know, any changes in the workflow and maybe things that there have been learnings about the way of doing business internally. Let me, um, let me get us going with that, with, with an answer to that. I think um, when markets are volatile, but particularly when there's economic headwinds, it's actually when we at a rating agency can thrive because it's really when we make a difference to investors with our opinions and our analytical work. So I think in the past number of years with one crisis after another, I think that's what we've been uh, working really hard to do. Um, so I think well, you can say the jury is out if we've done that well, because it's been hugely uncertain times. So it's been quite a challenging job to give, you know, to, to um, do your credit analysis and your forward-looking uh, opinions um, in, in the best possible way. But uh, I, th I think that's a very team effort within, within Fitch. Uh, so, so I feel that that's an area where we've, we've come out reasonably well. I think what's been more impactful within Fitch has really been the way we work and the impact that one crisis after another has had on our workforce. And I think the way we have had to adjust, learn, um, maybe change our leadership style. Um, in any crisis, I think communication is really key. Um, but I think in the past few crises, I think it's been really important to understand the human impact and the element. Um, and it started with myself. Um, mm -hmm. When in the pandemic, I was no longer, I'd only just arrived in New York with my whole family. And I was no longer able to travel home to see my family for a few years. And it made me realize, well, everyone has got a story with this pandemic. And what do I know? But I know it impacts people and how they perform. So I think, and then I'll stop because there's more to say, but <laughs> I'm interested to hear what, my, uh, what Kathy and, and do have to say as well on this. But I think sort of change in leadership style to be more empathetic and more open-minded to uh, what goes on in people's lives with these crises has been really important in how we work and for the quality of our product. 
Definitely, and I think that's one of the things that we've all noticed too is um, we used to leave most of ourselves at home when we were at the office, and of course that's appropriate for some yeah. purposes, but you know, there are, we are full beings that we had to bring more of ourselves there. And David, maybe if you can talk a little bit about the experience at DE Shaw over the last two years. Yeah, sure. So, you know, I think there's um, a lot to that question. And, um, you know, I think you can really answer it from both an investment perspective, but then also a non-investment perspective. So I think I'm going to try to take um, a stab at both. So from an investment per perspective, you mentioned uh, volatility. Um, and, you know, no investor is immune to volatility. Uh, I think what we try to do at DE Shaw in the way that we construct our portfolio is uh, we try to take only the risks that we intend to take um, through the way that we construct our trades. So for example, um, if I believe that company A in a specific industry is an excellent company and is going to, is going to produce strong returns um, and it's gonna outperform company B, one expression of that investment could be um, just go long company A. Uh, but of course, when you go long company A, you're also taking on some other risks, some equity market factor risks, some uh, uh, general industry risk. Um, uh, another expression of that trade could be go long company A relative to company B uh, and isolate the outperformance of company A versus company B. And in that case, because company B is in the same industry and they're both equity securities, you are isolating out both the market, equity market risk, and the industry level risk. Um, so there are, there are ways that we try to construct those trades and those investments such that um, we produce an all-weather uh, product that can um, perform in up markets and in, in down. Um, from a, from a non-investment perspective, man, all of, the, uh, all of the things that you highlighted are, are real human issues that have caused um, an enormous amount of pain and, and suffering. I mean, for me in particular, over the last two years, um, it's been incredibly difficult to seeing the moment of reflection mm -hmm. um, that this country has undergone as it relates to uh, the racial injustice that's existed in this country for a very long time. Um, and, you know, at, at times over the last few years, I felt like, you know, when is this going to end? You know, um, things are just falling apart. But it's at those exact moments. It's at those exact moments when organizations um, ought to provide uh, safe and inclusive work environments. And D.E. Shaw has done just that. Um, you know, D.E. Shaw had a pre-existing uh, commitment to D.E. and I. Um, and that commitment has only been strengthened um, throughout the pandemic. And the manifestation of that is multifold. Um, one way that we exhibit our focus on DEI um, is through increasing our exposure um, to that pipeline of diverse talent. Mm -hmm. We don't believe in the pipeline problem. Um, instead, we increase our exposure to those, to those candidates through things like undergraduate fellowships that have persisted throughout um, this time. Uh, additionally, uh, there are uh, a number of well-resourced affinity groups. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Black at Desco is an affinity group I'm a part of. I'm a part of the steering committee, and that's the affinity group for black employees at DE Shaw. Uh, furthermore, our head of diversity, equity, and inclusion is a managing director at the firm, the most senior level that you can be. Um, and uh, she continues to uh, make sure that DEI is a strategic imperative uh, for the firm. Fantastic. There's a lot that you said that I do want to get back to, but I do want to get Kathy in just talking a little bit about the last two years and how Morgan Stanley has managed through it and also just how it's impacted your workflow and how you present to clients. Absolutely. Uh, I, I think the biggest impact I saw at Morgan Stanley was not only uh, what Indu was speaking about, which was really important, but I think you cover that very nicely. Um, and, and Morgan Stanley made a real um, effort to make sure there was a lot of inclusion and conversations and also direction from within communities versus people outside communities deciding to, to direct it. So that's super helpful. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, it's, I think the mental wellness was really addressed quite well. And there were, you know, everybody at the firm had the opportunity for um, complimentary 
therapy, mm -hmm. many sessions, which was super helpful, and then also being able to allow for our employees to take leave and give an additional leave for helping with children who were home, parents, and other things that were going on. So I do think when you're in a company that has a strong culture and is aware um, of how to address these things, it's, it's a better outcome. Yeah, it, it was fascinating um, in lines of work, just the types of conversations that never would have happened so out in the open about people struggling, you know, juggling a bunch of different things, you know, just personal uncertainty, just, you know, being embraced in corporate environments. And um, hopefully that stays even as we kind of move out of this challenging frame. Uh, Kathy, I do want to start um, with you on this question, because Morgan Stanley has talked a lot about um, and companies that have kind of more diverse uh, leadership actually seeing less volatility in their returns. And if you could kind of maybe speak a little bit about those findings. Sure, absolutely. And I, and I think that's a great point. We've all seen the statistics about mm -hmm. having diversity in the workforce and what that means. But at the, at the end of the day, what it really means is that when you bring different um, minds, not like-minded minds all the time, mm -hmm. but differentiated thoughts and opinions um, to the table, different age groups and, and so forth, the outcome is that you are bringing everything to the table. And when you bring everything to the table, you can pick the best of the best in terms of thoughts and progress and move it that, that towards, you know, forwards. And it's been measured. So it's an interesting concept, but it's actually a reality too. Excellent. And then I want to go to you, especially on the activist standpoint, just curious maybe how much diversity and ESG type situations factor into the decision making when going after a company and, you know, maybe saying, do there, does there need to be a change to management, you know, and we believe that there will be a better investment return if there is. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, I think the way that I'll approach that is um, to really support what Kathy has, has said. Mm -hmm. um, there is both data out there that supports the business case for diversity, but then there's also just logic, mm -hmm. right? Um, to, to Kathy's point, when, um, particularly in tumultuous and volatile and uncertain times, um, the ability to feel confident and, and have conviction in your decisions is limited by the fact that um, we're involved on in uncertain times. Um, so that increases the importance of having a sound and rigorous decision-making process. It's higher likelihood that you'll have a sound and rigorous decision-making process when, to Kathy's point, you have differing opinions in the room, independent minds that are pushing the envelope on all sides of mm -hmm. an issue. Um, and then ultimately you get to an answer. Um, and the likelihood of, of having that environment is driven higher by having diverse teams. So that's the logic to support the findings um, from Morgan Stanley and, you know, McKinsey has research out there and MSCI has put research out there. So um, they, they've shown a correlation. Um, I see it in my business as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, in, it's an incredible um, focus for me when, um, when we have uh, influence over board composition mm -hmm. of the companies that we engage with to think hard about how do I broaden the search to make sure that there is a, a diversity lens um, when we're when we're finding uh, candidates and it's in the results mm -hmm. um, this year in 2022 the majority of the board seats that we've had influence over have gone to uh, women so, and I just want to follow up with you quickly on that point, because uh, earlier you were talking about the pipeline issue. And just curious, in doing the search, when people say, oh, there's a pipeline issue, if you're talking about a board, usually it's C-suite. And if there aren't many people of diverse makeup, then you're not going to have many nominee or uh, uh, yeah, candidates for a board. Just curious if you're looking deeper for different types of experience where there's tons of smart people who may have never sat in a C-suite. Just kind of curious how you're approaching that. Yeah, I would say yes to all of that. Mm -hmm. um, I think it it behooves you to be creative when trying to um, solve this um, solve this solve this issue. Um, you know, one of the problems we're trying to solve is the fact that there isn't diversity on these boards, and the reason that there isn't diversity on these boards <laughs> is the same reason there isn't diversity in the C-suite. Yeah. So you have to be thoughtful about you know, should we be looking just a level below that? Should we be thinking broader and wider? Should we be looking at capacity rather than specific experience? Um, so these are all things that we take into account. 
Excellent. And Marianne, in your work at Fitch, I'm just curious um, how much diversity factors into the analysis when you're doing a credit rating on a company or industry. Um, I, it's, that's a, I, I wish more already, but mm -hmm. I think it, it needs, uh, needs time and analysis to really see like what impact diversity has on a credit rating, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than just investment returns, et cetera. So I don't think we've yet found, uh, say like, well, our ratings move up and down because of diversity. I would love us to find more of that. So I do think as part of our, 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 our DEI initiatives, we'll be doing more of that analysis. Um, so, and also through our, um, through our um, uh, f uh, sustainable Fitch, which uh, assigns ESG ratings, clearly we are going to look closer at the, the impact that diversity makes. But I think it's, I think from our perspective, I think credit-wise it's probably a bit too narrow, but I think mm -hmm. ESG-wise and the impact that diversity has through the, through the social and sustainable uh, impact is, is really where you need to look. It's the impact, the broader impact. Excellent. And I do want to stick with you on this question. So when we're looking at leadership roles, um, I'm just kind of curious what maybe some of the research is saying about the qualities in a leader that are important. And I feel that especially over the last two years, there's been a huge change in that. We were talking earlier about uh, you know people being able to bring their whole self to work or not, or just anything in your findings, um, whether, again, it's internally at Fitch or just as you speak with uh, people in the business community. Yeah, and it actually picks up on a point that um, do made. I, I really feel that in, um, and I see that within Fitch, that, oh, sorry, but that we've worked, <laughs> worked through through um, through these last few years of crisis after crisis, that um, you say well, it needs diverse voices to to push the envelope. I think it needs diverse voices to think outside the box. Mm -hmm. uh, really, you need that. But I, I think that element that I uh, mentioned earlier, the more empathic leadership, I think is really important. I think having diversity, having women, having people with various more, uh, backgrounds that have perhaps had to work and have a better understanding of how people feel in, in particular situations, I think really add that uh, ability to think outside the box. Um, uh, but I also think, and we talked a little bit mm -hmm. about that before this panel, I think it's okay to say, right, we're living and leading in ambiguity. Yeah. I just might not know all the answers, but let's just talk about what the answers might be or in, in different directions. And I think, I have sometimes felt in my own growth as a leader um, and being sort of a minority female leader, sometimes I was like, oh, I need to make a decision. I need to go clearly in one direction. And now I'm saying like, yes, I need to make a decision, but I'm going to take a pause to listen and to see, mm -hmm. you know, and, and to acknowledge the fact that this uncertainty, I'm not going to solve the uncertainty. I can only address the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And I think diversity and having different backgrounds and different styles really helps there. And I, I see that within Fitch, and I enjoy that, to see mm -hmm. also being able to source that within the organization. Yeah, I think management bringing that self-awareness can certainly help. Kathy, anything you have to say about things that you've seen that work for leadership, especially as we're kind of navigating through a changing hybrid or whatever workforce? Yeah, I do think that as leaders, we have to you know, think about things and also have an impact in the sense that we're sharing uh, an open space and having conversations. I was sharing earlier, I'm the mother of three adult children and I have two daughters. Mm -hmm. And one topic that you know comes to mind is particularly with women in the workforce not being able to like navigate it as well. How do they navigate it? How do they get paid? Um, what they're worth? And that would apply to any of us. You know, are we being valued? Are we being paid? commiserate to what our job description is and, the, and what we're bringing to the table. And I would say having conversations around money and not being afraid to discuss that topic because it's, a, it's taboo for a lot of people. And the more open we are about that conversation, I think the stronger we're going to get in making a difference or an impact. So um, one of my daughters was working at a firm and she thought she was being underpaid for quite a while after talking to one of her colleagues. She brought it up to management in a very um, respectful way, had a conversation, brought the data with her, and not only did they agree to bump up her pay, but they back paid her. And I, and I think that the reason why she was able to do that is because we're all having these conversations on a regular basis about what should be done in order to bring you know, diversity into the workplace, know our value, and keep people in the workplace as well, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And just and doing maybe your work experience, you know, just any changes you've seen in leadership, um, how approachable management has been over the last few years, or just any changes you've seen, or anything when you're looking for a board member that sticks out? 
Yeah, I think in in my experience, it's been um, you know f- flexibility and, mm-hmm. and open openness. Um, you know, I think uh, there rightly should be a premium placed on the ability to 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 think and to learn. Um, and you know, this is from Adam Adam Grant's book, mm-hmm. um, uh, Think Again. Um, and I it fully I fully agree with it, which is. There should also be a premium placed on the ability to rethink one's assumption and to unlearn um, one's um, historically held uh, views, and that gets to the point on sort of capacity, the the capability of, of someone uh, versus their their experience level, and like how mm-hmm. do you how do you how do you weight those two things? Yeah, I think that's such a huge point because there's always those pre- preconceived notions of a certain. Uh, college course to MBA track and all oh, that makes a leader. It's like people have lots of experience in many different ways. <laughs> so I do want to turn because I realize we have a few minutes left. So obviously uh, we are dealing with tons of market volatility right now. Um, calls for a recession, um, calls that there will be a recession, I should say. Um, every day we see a new headline of layoffs. You know, just maybe I'll start with you, Kathy, just in your line of work, when you're dealing with clients' money, I mean, you must be getting a ton of phone calls. So what do you do? What's the advice? Sure. So I do get phone calls, but not as many as you would think, and I'll Mm -hmm. explain why. So a lot of my clients are actually C-suite executives and also Mm -hmm. business owners. Um, And if you have your money laid out a certain way, which is you have your emergency fund, it sounds so basic and such a simple concept, but it's real. If you have money set aside for like the next six to 12 months in case something happens, you you lose a job, you have some big item that happens, you can afford to let your investment money, which is longer term focused, ride the ups and downs of this market. You can have a longer term view with your money. So there are things that we'll tell our clients during this time period. Volatility is an opportunity. It's the Mm -hmm. time where you can look at your portfolio. Everything is down, the good and the bad take a look what's not working or what's not going to come back. Now is a time to recalibrate. It's a great opportunity to create tax losses um, where you can quickly reinvest back into the market and then when the market goes up, you know, potentially gain from that as well. But really, if you think short-term money, liquid money for your short-term needs in the next six to 12 months and you can be in the market long-term if you've got a longer time horizon. And it's so simple, but it it's really is the, the key to successful investing. Yeah, especially with clients, you always have to remind them, we made the plan in better times knowing that maybe not exactly this, but something like this would happen. Right. So Marianne, I have to say, at Fitch, volatile markets must make your workload a little bit heavier. So kind of what are you seeing? What's on your radar? Definitely, it does create work. But as I, I said earlier, it also means it's times that we can actually add more value. So I think that's mm-hmm. it's, that's what we're there to do. Um, I think, I mean, on a basic level, it means we will be reviewing our, our ratings and our analytical work more frequently. But it starts usually off with more sort of broader research. Um, w- what if inflation goes to mm-hmm. so much and it lasts for so long? What do we see the impact on a certain sector? Um, what if interest rates are going to rise? Well, that's good for banks. I haven't had that for a while, but it comes a turning point when it's not so good for banks anymore. So trying to really, first on that higher level, um, you know, bring out, bring out that, 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 that analysis, which I think we're uniquely positioned uh, for. Um, but also not underestimating that there are some unique features to, I think, this potential coming recession. Mm-hmm. We're still having a very strong labor market. Um, we have an energy crisis in, in Europe that is, is like off the scale, I would say, and uh, creates a, a, a lot of debt with, with countries. How is that going to be resolved? So I think we're going to have no crisis is the same. We're going to have uh, no recession is the same. We're going to have unique features there. But what I think is important to remember, at least in, for, in, our, in our teams as well, that many of our analysts have not yet gone through a recession. Mm-hmm. They've, they've experienced a lot of things in the past number of years, but they've not gone through a recession. So I think that's something um, where, where we need to um, make sure that we, you know, we, 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 we do our work, work very diligently and, uh, and look back at what history tells us as well. Exactly. And so, Andrew, you may or may not know this, but I love writing about shareholder activism. I look at volatility. And as a reporter, I start to get excited because I'm like, oh, are activists going to come out? Are they going to, you know, that old uh, Warren Buffett saying there were 
tied. Guys, go out, you see who's wearing their swimsuit. Exactly. <laughs> so just curious, in your line of business, I mean, is this like, you know, the Super Bowl for you? Or? Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with, with Kathy mm -hmm. um, that volatility really does present opportunity because the likelihood that there's going to be some disconnect between the price signal and mm -hmm. reality is much, much higher when you have volatile markets and, you know, the baby's getting thrown out with the bathwater and um, it's, uh, it, it's uh, everything's moving in one direction and correlations uh, move to one. Um, so, so I do think it, it presents a pretty substantial um, opportunity. And uh, I think our, our, our view is that we don't, we don't have a crystal ball. Um, mm -hmm. We don't try to be um, super forecasters. Um, but instead, we, we try to uh, position our portfolio, as I was mentioning up front, um, for uh, all, all weather, all types of markets. Excellent. So, Marion, I'll start with you on this one, since you are on the credit side, you know, knowing what we're facing. Is there anything that you think companies or industries can do to protect themselves or any positive signs that companies can show for navigating through a possible downturn? Well, there's in downturns also always companies and sectors that are actually on the upside of that, yeah. right? So there's not only losers, there'll be winners and losers if you like. But I think the bigger concern is where um, it actually impacts uh, people on the street, right? So I think that's where, where we need to be mindful. I, I don't think we're um, necessarily hugely concerned about the, the large banks, for example, mm -hmm. because through the crisis that we had in the last few decades, their uh, buffers are, are really very solid. But business models will change. We'll have to change mm -hmm. to address what's going on in the, in the environment. We'll have to change also uh, what's going on with the uh, demands that investors are going to hold for uh, ESG, for example. So I, I think there's, there's new elements that are coming into our sector that maybe are not necessarily always the traditional credit risk that are also need to be factored in, like ESG, cyber risks, etc. And actually, those could have a financial impact too. So I'm going a little bit off track here, but I oh, absolutely, like there's, there's risks that we also need to be uh, be be uh, be um, and and companies that address those better, I think, will that's equally important. Fantastic. And you look at the wealth client level of this. So you spoke a little bit about this about the importance of having a financial plan, but just right. any other thoughts on preparing yourself to navigate through a crisis? I think when we're going through a crisis, it's a really important time to shore up your own personal financial situation and make sure that what you have in your portfolio is going to do well going forward. When you think about you know, credit, um, I think about credit from the standpoint of companies that have not strong balance sheets, weak balance sheets. They're the ones that are going to actually, they have the worst time paying back money that they borrow, but yet we're going to raise the interest rates on them. We're going to demand a higher risk premium because it's riskier to invest with them. I, I think you really want to look out for the areas of your portfolio that are going to add a little bit more risk in this time frame. You know, it, when the markets are doing great and the party's going strong, everything does well, but now is really the time to, to you know, sort of stream through that. And on the financial stand, financial mm -hmm. planning standpoint, everybody in this room should have a financial plan. It's you know where you're going to get from A to Z in your financial life. And I like to use a quick little analogy that when you're planning a trip, maybe now after COVID it's different, <laughs> but when you're planning a trip, you don't just show up at the airport and think about like which plane you're going to hop on and where you're going to go and which hotel you'll stay when you get there. You have to have a plan. If you plan, if you plan to travel, you should plan for your own personal financial life too. And having that will give you the, the, a great roadmap. Excellent. All simple stuff. Perfect. And last question for you, Andrew. So in a challenging time, yes, there could be some opportunities for activists and investors, but also how do you how do activists protect themselves as well? Any thoughts on how you guys manage risk? Uh, yeah, I mean at the risk of um, at the risk of sounding repetitive, mm -hmm. I, I would I would just highlight that um, in volatile times and in calm times, uh, we try to structure really every trade mm -hmm. in a way where we're betting on what we want to be betting on. Um, and if it's an if it's an activist campaign, if it's um, you know spinning off a division, s selling a, a, a piece of the company, if it's increasing margins through um, uh, better price optimization or, or cost structure optimization, that's what we want to bet on. Mm -hmm. um, and you know I think we have the tools at our disposal to structure our trades in a way where we can isolate that bet. 
Excellent. Yeah, I think you said it perfectly earlier too, just not taking the risks you don't want to be taking. <laughs> so, well guys, thank you so much. Uh, we are out of time. Um, great conversation, uh, especially as we may be going through a challenging or interesting end of the year, but one hopefully with a lot of opportunities too. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.